Okay, so I'm going to start off by nailing my colours to the mast. I think Hazel is brilliant, but within reason. And I'll come back to why I'm saying within reason toward the end of the talk. Now, what I'm hoping to do this evening is to get people to start seeing the wood for the trees and maybe to appreciate how wonderful Hazel in the Burren can be. When we think of woodland, most of us think of ones with proper trees, things like oak, ash, birch, or even non-native such as beech and specimen conifers. If we think of hazel, we tend to think in terms of scrub, something that we don't see as being as good or as valuable as the proper woodlands. So how did hazel go from being the tree of knowledge that features in Irish and European folklore, or, or one of the nobles of the woods alongside the, the, alongside the mighty oak, the yew, the ash and Scots pine, this was a feature of the Brehan law, to just being dismissed as scrub, an underscore story shrub of other more interesting woodlands, or even as abandoned coppice. Well, I don't know for sure, but I suspect it's because we no longer see hazel as being useful. We've lost our connection to it. And historically, hazel was brilliant. It gave us so much. It gave us food. Hazelnuts are very rich in fats, proteins, and essential trace elements and minerals. It provided us with the fuel to heat our homes, to cook with. And it was, as charcoal, it was a major uh, fuel in the smelting industries for smelting iron ore and other metals before the Industrial Revolution gave us building materials, fencing, we made our houses, wattle and daub, and it also provided tools. But today we've got much easier, more modern replacements, and we just no longer really value hazel. It, and if you think about it, hazel doesn't even have the decency to grow as a majestic tree. It's just a big bush, really. So, when it comes to hazel in the Burren, it's a really, really important component of the landscape and it adds so much to the biodiversity of the Burren. And I really think that more of us need to learn to embrace it and appreciate it. So what is hazel? Well, I think there's about 14 species of hazel, but the only one that's native to Ireland is Coralis abalana. Um, as is often documented in the books, oops, getting carried away and pressing buttons here, it grows as an understory shrub in woodlands, it grows in hedgerows, and it grows in scrub, particularly in limestone areas. And if we're reading texts on this, they aren't wrong to talk about hazel in these terms. They're just failing to tell the full story. And really they're being somewhat dismissive of how important hazel actually can be. And some of the books I read might mention the extensive areas of hazel scrub on the limestone in the Boran. But they didn't go into any real description or discussion. It was just that bold statement that they occurred here. And until quite recently, you never really got mention of any of the brilliant hazel woodlands on the west coast of Scotland. And really, why would they? Because in Scotland, they've got the Caledonian pine forests and they were the ones that were seen as the jewel in the crown. So a little bit about hazel itself. Um, hazel grows naturally as a multi-stem shrub um, and it's a growth form that it will uh, retain as it gets older. So here we see early encroaching hazel with its multiple poles. And we also see a much older, more mature, but it's retained this multiple stemmed growth form. Now in sheltered areas, hazel can get up to five to six meters in height. But in the boron between the poor soils and the wind, it rarely gets above three metres tall, even when um, it's quite shel um, sheltered. So the male catkins um, first appear in the autumn, and they're not very obvious then. Um, and they don't elongate until spring when they release their pollen. And then they become really, really um, obvious within the hazel scrub, they almost glow in the spring light. But if you want to see the female flowers, you really have to get up close and personal. And it's worth doing because they always remind me of tiny beadlet anemones scattered through the hazel canopy. And they have these little dark red stigma which catch the wind born pollen. And of course, once they've caught the pollen and the flowers have been fertilized, you'll get the familiar hazelnut developing over the summer period. Now, the leaves, 
quite big, round, nothing fancy, serrated edges, and they emerge after the flowers have, have finished, really. And they're quite soft at first, but they rapidly harden and they've got these stiff hairs on the upper surface, which uh, makes them rough and discourages some livestock from eating them. The nuts will ripen on the bush itself and then they'll drop off in autumn. And if they land somewhere suitable, they'll germinate the following spring. Of course, that's if something else hasn't come along and eat them. Now, the hazel seedlings themselves are quite intolerant of long term shading, which is why if you go into more shady, well developed hazel woodlands, you'll rarely see a hazel seedling. But the, they're extremely good at colonising open grassland where there's plenty of light. And although grazing will suppress hazel, seed, hazel seedlings, it's rarely going to kill them. What it does is result in an awful lot of stunted hazel saplings, which have put a lot of energy into developing their root systems and are ready to rapidly grow should the grazing pressure have been taken off. Now, these are two tiny little seedlings, um, which might be anything between one and two years, 10 years old, but they keep getting browsed off. So they're quite woody, which shows they're old. And this one has quite a well-developed lichen on its stem that doesn't grow overnight. So again, I suspect this one could be at least 10 years. So they're sitting there waiting for their chance. And once the grazing is relaxed, they can take off. And once they get above a certain height, they're no longer suppressed by grazing. And another feature is if you go out onto areas of the Borough where you've got a lot of these small hazel bushes, you can sometimes be amazed at the crop of nuts that they bear. And this really does accelerate the rate of colonisation of hazel onto some of the grasslands of the Borough. So is hazel a tree or a bush? Bush and shrub are often used as synonymous terms. Really, it's all about semantics. I mean, Tree is usually defined as being a sing having a single trunk and growing to above five metres tall under normal circumstances. Whereas a bush or a shrub has multiple stems and generally uh, grows to less than five metres tall. And that firmly makes hazel a bush. But we shouldn't be snobby about this, just comparing a bush and a tree. Just because hazel is not a tree doesn't make it any less important. However, under certain circumstances, hazel will uh, appear to be tree-like. It'll have a tree-like growth form. This is actually abnormal and occurs where you've got heavy browsing. So all the new stems and poles that start to grow get browsed off and all the energy goes into one or two of the trunks and you get what looks like a tree. But once you remove the grazing, the hazel doesn't stay as a tree. It rapidly starts to reverse to its, its bush growth format. So next question, is it hazel scrub or hazel woodland? And again, it's semantics. I mean, woodland generally refers to an area where the vegetation is dominated by trees and, an air, and scrub where it's dominated by bushes. So here at Rock Forest, we've got an area of woodland, we've got Scots pine, ash, though we might not have the ash for much longer, um, oaks, and there's an understory of hazel, white thorn and other shrubby species. And it's often taken that woodlands are the climax cat plant community and that all scrub is is a developmental phrase from an open grassland habitat, for example, to a proper woodland. But this isn't the case in the Burren. Our hazel dominated scrub that's found here, the same as on the west coast of Scotland, is actually the climax vegetation. It is the woodland. It's not going to go through to a, a different type of woodland like ash or elm unless we get significant changes in the climate or environment. Now, the way I think about it is hazel scrub is generally less developed. It has lots of thin poles, it's quite dense, and it's hard to get through. You're pushing through something that's quite packed, compact and like a thicket. And where it's on quite rocky substrates, it can stay in this format for quite a long time. Whereas what I think of hazel woodland is much more developed. It's got a closed canopy overhead. It's much more spacious. You can go in, you can move around it. It feels like you're in a woodland. And to quote the late Mike Proctor, some of the hazel woods in the, uh, the hazel scrub in the Burren and the West Scotland are certainly woods in all but name.
Now, Scotland, on the basis of knowing that their hazelwoods are actually ancient woodland with a continuity of cover going back hundreds, if not thousands of years, has have elevated their hazel to a habitat that they're really proud of. And that is Atlantic hazel woodland. And the best gu guide to hazel woods and Atlantic hazel woodlands is this booklet that was published by Sandy and Brian Coppins back in 2012. And it's really, really informative book. Um, and I have to say it was um, Sandy and Brian that first got me interested in Atlantic hazel woodlands. Um, it is available to download from the um, Nature Scott website. Um, so I'd encourage people to do that. But one of the things I like about this book is, is the quote at the beginning, which is discovery consists of seeing what everybody else has seen and thinking what nobody else has thought. And Sandy and Brian certainly did that when it came to hazel. So is hazel scrub in the Boran Atlantic hazel woodland too? Well, if we take age as a defining factor, then no. Um, even our best developed areas of hazel scrub are not very old. Um, so what I'd argue is that it shouldn't just be about age, but rather a combination of other factors. And I think that at least some of the hazel in the Burren, if not a significant proportion, should be recognised as Atlantic hazel woodland. Now, given the history of the hazel in the Burren, it might not be as old, as well developed or as biodiverse as it is in, in Scotland, but it's still brilliant. So a really quick history of hazel in the Burren. Hazel appeared after the last ice age, following on um, the birch and pine. There was lots of it for thousands of years, all over Ireland and including the Burren. However, by 1655, in the barony of the Burren, we know that the cover of woodland was less than 1% and of shrubbery was 2.7%. And yes, those of you who are fans of Monty Python can have an outbreak of the knights who say me and we demand a shrubbery. However, by the 1800s, we know that there was even less hazel woodland. Um, and at that time, it's recorded that there was a few uh, fuel famine, there was less shrubbery, there was less woodland. But by the 1890s, hazel had started to slowly reappear in the, um, in the Burren. And the reason for this is one, the drop in the population after the famine and also a massive decrease in the population of grazing sheep. And ever since then, hazel has been steadily increasing and may even be at uh, a, an exponential growth phase now. So this is uh, a section from the Ordnance Survey map published in 1842. And this is Schlieve Karen or uh, Eagles Rock, the nature reserve. And those of you who are familiar with it will recognize here, we've got the massive cliff at the back, the scree slopes, um, the church, St. Dewey's Church. Um, these areas here are the Drumlin Fields and over the rest of the flat area we've got rough pasture shown. Now the thing about this map is there is not a single bush shown. In fact look over these maps for the Burren at this time and there's just hardly anything other than the odd orchard shown uh, that's woody in nature. If you were to look at the uh, map that was published in 1890s, I think it was, the second edition, you'll actually see the odd scattered bush showing in here, but there was still very little scrub being shown at that time. So this means that the scrub's probably quite young. Now, this is a photograph I took from an aeroplane in 2011. And don't worry, the plane wasn't flying on this angle. I've twisted it round so it matches the map. So here we've got the, Schlieve, the cliff at Schlieve Karen. And as you can see, there's hazel creeping up and the scree slopes have almost disappeared under hazel. And at this end, we've got a small outcropping area of um, ash woodland. So looking at those, we can see there's a massive expansion of hazel. And this has been going up, has happened really since the 1890s. It's come all the way out here. This area that we can see at this point is the one of the Drumlin fields that's here on the map. And this here is this one here. So we can see the hazel really has expanded right out and is covering 
this all this area. And that's only in approximately 130 years. So most of the scrub we're seeing at Shreve-Karen, which is one of our best developed uh, hazel woodlands, is less than 130 years and probably significantly so. So our hazel woodlands are way, way younger than the Scottish ones. So was hazel in the Boran coppiced? A lot of people look at hazel and think it's big coppice. And naturally it grows as a multi-stemmed bush. So the multi-stem bush that we form we're used to seeing in the Burren is not the result of coppicing by man. That's what hazel does normally. And it's a real misconception uh, that's often repeated. And I've had foresters say it to me that hazel will die if it's not coppiced. Um, but that's far from the truth. Hazel's actually self-coppicing. The individual poles will grow up, they'll mature, and they'll die in a naturally replenishing cycle. And it, this is quite interesting because it means that a hazel bush as, as an organism is constantly regenerating. And if they're left to their own devices, they could, in theory, live for an incredibly long time, hundreds, possibly more than a thousand years old. They could, in terms of the age of the organism, rival some of our, the veteran trees we're so proud and um, in awe of, these massive oaks and, and yew trees. But again, hazel stays understated. It just is a spreading bush. Um, so in terms of coppicing, <clears throat> it would be wrong to say that coppicing of hazel didn't take place in the Borum because we know that significant quantities of so these teas of hazel scallops were exported from the Burren for the thatching industry. And that is in quite recent history. But the question is what form of coppicing was taking place here? Now, there's a real dearth of accurate written evidence about the management of hazel in many places, including the Burren. And most of the information that you see in books on uh, coppicing really refers to uh, that in managed woodlands, particularly in the south of England, where you had an organised cycle of cutting, regrowth and recutting. And I think it's really unlikely that this was happening in the Burren. Instead, what probably happened is what they postulated for the Scottish Hazel Woods, and which can be seen here in this uh, wood pasture in Ireland, in Sweden. And that's a form of selective coppicing. So if we look at this hazel bush in the middle here, and we look, you can see that actually what has been done here is half of the hazel stool has been cut, not all of it, just half. And when I was looking at this, it reminded me, one of the farmers near Ballyvahan told me at the time when his father was doing quite a lot of thatching, he used to manage hazel um, on their land by going and cutting a third of the stool. And by doing that, what you did was you created a, a, a gap in the canopy. So your new shoots grew quickly and straight up to the light there, powered by the two thirds of the remaining stool that are in place. So this was a very selective way of taking what you needed. Again, if you look at this hazel here, it had actually had just a couple of, um, poles that were the right size taken out. If you think about it, if you go and cut the whole bush, you're going to have only a few pieces of it that fit your requirements on the day. The rest is waste. Okay, you can go and burn it, but you're also destroy destroying the rest of the bush, which might be useful to you later on. So I think in these areas where you didn't have hazel cut to fuel um, industry or massive towns like London, we probably saw a much more selective approach to coppicing. So is there any evidence of coppicing in the Burren? It's quite hard to pick up because you're looking at a bush that naturally grows as a multiple stem and when it's coppiced, looks like something with multiple stems. And plus any coppicing that we're trying to pick up probably happened quite a while ago and we're only going to see evidence of coppicing post the 1900 regrowth and expansion of hazel in the Burren. You can it, see coppicing far more easily in other trees such as ash because what you'll find there is they have abnormal multiple trunks instead of the single trunk we're used to seeing. However in wandering around the Burren I remember coming across this 
hazel stool a good number of years ago. And it's got quite thick trunk-like branches, which are leaning out from a central area. Now, part of this growth form might be to do with browsing, but the shape and the feel is very reminiscent of some hay, um, ash that's been um, coppiced where you get this growth out from the original trunk at the sides and it looks a bit like this. And this next one, again, it's just, when I saw it, it was the feel of it, it just felt different. And this is in a small field, which would have been an open pasture. It's near an old mine and there's a house nearby. And when I looked at it, there's actually, these two sections are joined um, and it did feel reminiscent of some abandoned coppice that I've seen in parts of Britain. Um, it could just be that two parts of this hazel bush are slowly moving apart, or it could be that there were two bushes there. We just don't know, but it's, it's, it's fascinating to wander around in the borough and just um, think about what's going on. So I was out doing some work last weekend and as is my wont sometimes, I wandered into this little area of hazel here. It's quite a shallow hollow with a wall around it. And when I got in there, the hazel didn't seem particularly old. It's an exposed spot. So it's somewhat stunted by the wind um, burning off the growing tips. And that sort of thing means that quite often hazel doesn't become quite as well developed with such big um, branches that it stays much more light with sort of lighter poles like you can see in this picture. But I started thinking about it when we look at these little walled places in the borough we often think ah that was walled so there's deep soil there somebody grew something a crop there. And quite often that was probably the case, but I really wonder about here. The soil was very wet and very dauby. It wasn't great for growing anything on. And I know that these little fields here probably were cropped in the past. There's a cottage lost in the scrub here. And over in the scrub here, there's a wonderful cottage with a whole system of little garden fields um, around it. So there were better areas very close by if you wanted to, to grow your vegetables. The other theory is that a lot of these were used to put livestock in, but if I was putting livestock in here to hold them, I'd probably put them in here. This is a really sheltery hollow plus it's got water. So then I start thinking, if you're living in a house down here or over here and you want to supplement your income from producing hazel scallops, you need to protect your hazel because if you go and coppice an area, your livestock are more likely to come in and graze the regrowth, and that's going to stop your um, the, the, the new growth that you want to cut for scallops coming through. So it's just an idea that possibly some of these might actually have been used as areas of hazel coppice in the past. Again, this is all pie in the sky thought on my part. There's no real proof about it. So originally when I intended to, was going to do this talk, I intended to focus most of it on biodiversity associated with hazel in the Budler, in, in the Burren. But the more and more I thought about it, the more I felt I'd be doing hazel a disservice if I didn't give it a fair hearing. And hopefully I've done that in this first part. So what follows now is a really brief flavour of how hazel adds to the biodiversity in the Burren. Uh, and I really had to cut this section. Um, it's, a, it's a talk in its own right. So as spring approaches in the borough, my thoughts always turn to the hazel woods and scrub and the coming spring flowers. And in both the more mature hazel woodland and the immature hazel here that's developing, you get common plants such as the lesser celandine being joined by common woodland species such as wood sorrel, uh, early dog violet and wood sanicle. As you move deeper into the more developed hazel woodland, you start to see plants that are often described as old woodland indicators like the bluebell. And it's quite a feature of this particular woodland um, that you see quite a lot of early purple orchids. Now, we tend to think of early purple orchids as being a plant of open grasslands, but in Nordic areas, they think of it as a plant of woodlands. And again, in these more mature areas, you tend to find, find certain plants like the wooden enemy, 
um, wild garlic or rancins and the wood rot. And sometimes, if you're really, really lucky, you come across the wow plants. These are plants you don't see very often. And these three are not only quite rare, but they're also unusual in that they lack chlorophyll, so they can't make their own food by photosynthesis. Instead, the bird's nest orchid, which we've got here, and the yellow bird's nest, which we've got here, which isn't an orchid, and which I always think uh, resembles a sickly zombie bluebell, um, obtain their food from fungi. And this is by being parasitic on the fungi. It's not a symbiotic relationship. Now, the toothwort is slightly different and it parasitizes trees and particularly in the burrow, it parasitizes hazel. And that's where it obtains its nutrients from. And it's a real red, de red letter day for me when I come across any of these. And there's another plant that's got quite a fascinating relationship with hazel and the burren because it's not with the well-developed hazel scrubland. And this is common cow wheat. Um, it's a semi-parasitic plant that I only ever see in low open hazel where it's encroaching onto species for rich grassland. And you can just see patches of it here and here. So why it does this, I don't know, because I never see it if it's in the grassland itself, um, it, where there's no hazel, I, and you don't see it once the hazel becomes developed. So I suspect it must be interacting with the ha hazel itself somehow, and it probably disappears um, with age as it gets shaded out. Uh, again, that's something for me to look at in my retirement. Now, hazel supports so much biodiversity that there's not time to cover all of it today. It's absolutely brilliant. And this all adds to the importance of hazel as a habitat in the burren. So what we have here are bryophytes, mosses, um, liverworts, ferns, insects, birds, mammals, fungi, and even slime molds. It's just a wonderful place. But what is it that makes the burren's hazel so special? Well, the first thing is, as I've said before, hazel here is the climax vegetation. It is the woodland. And this is really, really rare on the worldwide scale. It's hard to believe when we sit in the Burren and we're seeing it all over the place, but it's really, really rare. Now, there are other areas with hazel woodland in, in Ireland. Um, for example, Clawhan uh, Hazelwood Lear, Clomac Noise in Offaly. And that's also on limestone pavement. So what makes our burren hazel different to this hazel in inland areas of burren? Well, it's the fact they're inland. Here on the burren, we're right on the edge of the Atlantic. We've got a really highly oceanic climate. We've got high rainfall, mild climate, and this creates wonderfully drippy, cool, humid microclimate within the hazel. So the hazel itself, the rocks on the ground just become cloaked in mosses, liverworts and lichens. And this is actually part of the coastal temperate rainforest, which is one of the um, defined habitats on a worldwide nation. And this is really, really rare. It's only found in seven regions of the world. Um, which you, you, you can possibly go and find a map to see how rare it is. So not only have we got a rare habitat in that we've got hazel as climax woodland, but we've got that within a super rare habitat, a, a much rarer world habitat. So look, we've just got to give hazel in the burren some respect. Now, when it comes to the importance and championing of Atlantic hazel woodlands um, as a habitat, it's mainly down to people like these uh, lichenologists, and particularly the Scottish-based lichenologist, Brian Coppins, who I mentioned before. And Brian was really the first person who started to look at lichens in, on hazel woods in the west coast of Scotland, and he realised that there was something very different going on um, in the hazel there compared to hazel woodlands elsewhere. And if you look at hazel poles growing outside of the coastal rainforests, and this is one I took in a hedgerow in Wales a couple of weeks ago, you'll see that the stem is hazel brown. And hazel brown is obviously the colour that most people see when they see hazel. 
because it's translated into our language as a definition of a particular type of brown. We talk about people having hazel eyes. So brown is the normal colour. But look at hazel in the Burren, and it doesn't look at all like that. The majority of the new poles, even in old um, growth, older growth hazel, are going to look white. And if you zoom in and look closer, you're not actually really seeing much, if any, bark. What you're seeing is a living skin formed by a mosaic of different crustose lichens. And you can see there's a number of different types here, different shapes and patterns growing. And we've got these war zones in between as they're fighting over their territory. So if you go into young hazel wood growing on limestone pavement, you'll often see the poles look like this. And and uh, in even and the new poles in the hazel woodland, you'll rarely see things that are bare and hazel brown. So in those habitats, these crustose lichens are the dominant type. But go into the damper, shadier woodlands where the mosses and liverworts have grown over the crustose lichens, you start to see the lovely leafy lichens. So here we've got a whole heap of different species, and I'm not going to go into the names today because um, I'll get carried away, plus they've changed half the names on me recently and I haven't yet learned the new ones. But they're just amazing. I mean, this is just a, less than a foot of a small spindly branch and it's just full of different mosses, different liverworts, different lichens. It's just wonderful. And many of the lichens we see here are, are rare and threatened because not only do they require quite oceanic climates, but many of them are very sensitive to airborne pollution. And really, the Burren's Atlantic hazel woodlands are brilliant for this group of lichens in particular. It could just be that I'm biased because I find these leafy lichens much easier uh, to identify than the dots and squiggles of the crustose lichens, nearly all of which I've long forgotten the names of. And I, as I said, I'm not going to go into the lichens now. If you want to find out a little bit more about the uh, lichens of oceanic woods, um, I direct you to a recent book by Paul Whelan, um, which is an introductory guide to the oceanic lichens of Glengariff Woodlands. Okay, it's not the Burren, but a lot of these, um, because it's also an oceanic habitat overlap with the Burren. However, you could wait because at the moment, Paul is drafting um, uh, a document or a, a booklet on um, hazel um, and lichen and hazel and lichens on limestone within the Burren. So that's something to look forward to going forward. I can't talk about Burren hazel without mentioning this fungus because I just think this is one of the coolest fungi going. Now it doesn't look particularly uh, exciting. If we look here we can see a mauvey sort of crust beneath uh, the 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 hazel branch here. But what you do see quite a lot in the Boron as you walk through is what looks like twigs glued together with lumps of tar. And these are actually a growth from this fungus. And some people will tell you that this that joins bits of, of wood together so that the fungus can move through the canopy. But others uh, postulated that what the glue fungus is actually doing is it's gluing its food into the canopy and creating a larder for it. Because if you go and squeeze these little branches, they'll usually, they're very spongy because they've been digested. If you think about it, if this twig were to drop to the floor, then the glue fungus would have to compete with lots and lots of other saprophytic fungi in the soil. But by binding it into the canopy, it's probably competing with a far fewer um, fungi for this food than in, in it would be otherwise. Um, well, quite often these uh, appear as black tarry um, blobs. When they first form, they're actually white, and then go brown and through to black. And the other thing that I really love in uh, hazel woodlands is this uh, hazel gloves fungus. It's an exceptionally rare fungus. I think it used to be known from 15, 10 kilometer squares in Britain, um, might be known from a few more now. And it's generally recognized as being an indicator of potentially species rich Atlantic hazel woods. 
Um, it's not that uncommon in the boron. You'll see it on hazel and occasionally you'll find it growing on blackthorn and even briars when they're growing in established hazel woodlands. And one of the really cool things about this is that it's a hyperparasite. It's actually parasitizing the glue fungus and you can see the glue fungus growing under here. And when you go into quite a dark shady woodland, this fungus really does seem to grow. Now, it's quite interesting because the, the fruit bodies um, seem to appear on a branch or twig that's coming to the end of its life. So I remember in Shreve Karen, there was one branch which I visited for about two years on which I was always guaranteed to see uh, glue fungus. Um, and then it just disappeared. It, it, rot, it fell and rotted. And I've also seen it on, on, on other bushes do the same thing. So it might be that the fungus is there, but people haven't been able to detect it in the bark of hazel. Um, and it only starts to fruit when, when that branch is, is coming to the end of its life. But we don't really know. Um, I just downloaded a PhD on the subject, but again, uh, reading that's probably something from my retirement. Okay, so that was a bit of a rush through hazel woodland and straw, but I hope that I may have convinced some of you that hazel is a wonderful boron habitat and it adds so much to the biodiversity. So that begs the question that so often gets asked is why, if it's such a wonderful habitat, are we removing hazel from the boron instead of just letting it spread naturally? And that comes down to this, as wonderful a habitat as hazel is, it's relatively rapid spread onto the boron's open habitats. It's these species rich grasslands and heaths that are among the habitats that Ireland is duty bound to protect under the Habitats Directive, means that it's really threatening them. Um, and it's these grasslands and heaths, and along with limestone pavement, turlocks, and some other habitats, are the, are the reason that so much of the Boreen uplands and lowlands were designated as SAC. Unfortunately, nobody had recognised hazel at that stage as an important habitat in its own right. But, Forget about the designations and the le legislation reasons behind protecting these grasslands and that against the spread of hazel. Let's look at the boron in the context of the wider landscape. And really, the boron is a shining beacon in a country whose grasslands are dominated by species poor, intensively farmed fields. In contrast, in the boron, we've got these wonderfully species rich grasslands and heaths that bloom from March to October. Now, often they're celebrated for the rare plant communities, um, but really it's this vast flowering of species that were once common throughout Ireland that underpins much of the biodiversity that's in the borough. Things like the shrill cardaby, not anywhere else, but there's quite good populations here in the Boreen. And other things, like it's, I find it really difficult to believe that the dark green fritillary isn't under any threat at all, because you can see hundreds of these a day when you're out on the Boreen Wintridges in the summer, yet the populations are collapsing in other parts of Ireland and it's disappeared. So these grasslands, these long flowering grasslands are really, really important. Um, and one of the problems I found in living in the Boreen is the unusual becomes the normal. So this level of biodiversity we see in the grasslands is normal for us. So we can forget how badly nature is faring elsewhere. And I start to think of the boron as being like an ark. It's a last bastion for an increasing number of species that are dependent on open flowery habitats. And if we lose these open flowery habitats, we're gonna lose those species as well. But by keeping them open, or at least ensuring survival of populations that could spread out into the wider landscape should conditions become favourable in the future. And the thing is, to save what's here, we don't want to sink the ark by allowing it to be swamped by encroaching hazel. Conservation is all about finding a balance, and it's a really difficult thing to do. Um, somebody is always going to have you in, in, in the, the line of sight as doing something wrong. You're never going to satisfy everybody. But really, it is very much in the boron about finding a balance. 
We're not trying to say that one habitat is better than the other or more valuable than the other. But what we're trying to do is keep both the hazel woodlands and scrub, but also keep the species rich oak grasslands and heaths. And unfortunately, keeping the latter can only be achieved by slowing the unrelenting spread of hazel. I sometimes equate the spread of hazel to uh, trying to keep the tide back. I'm not sure we can do it at the end of the day, but we have to try. Um, so this is why I said at the start of this talk that hazel is brilliant, but within reason. And at the end of the day, a lot of the work that I've been involved with in the Boran is about trying to keep the earth afloat. But at the end of the day, hazel is still brilliant. Thank you very much. Karen, you are amazing as always. I don't think I've ever managed to listen to a talk where you've condensed a PhD, a couple of books, you've told you said it yourself, a two hour talk into 45 minutes and still managed to get Monty Python in there. So, um, well, 40 minutes according to my timer. 40 according to your time. Sharon, you, I, I always thought you were clever. You're just a genius, I think. <laughs> so, um, really brilliant talk, Sharon. And I definitely really enjoyed it. It's, it's good to see the importance of the hazel because, like you said, we spend so much time clearing it back on volunteer events and things um, and, and slowing that encroachment. But if there's any questions now from um, anyone out there that's listening, we've got the chat button or the question and answer button on the bottom. And uh, Sharon is a rare species. So now we have her here. Then definitely if you have any questions, ask them of her now because otherwise <laughs> she'll vanish into work and we probably won't see her again for another six months. So um, I, I think if there's no other questions there at the moment, you said to yourself, the biodiversity, you've managed to squeeze it into the tiniest ever and all your lichens. What is your favourite lichen? You're not allowed the glue one now. You've had the glue. Your favourite lichen. That's a, that's, that's, that's a non-lichenised fungus. Um, OK, my favourite lichen. Well, one of my favourites was a favourite because of its name. And it, it was called Degelia plumbia. And I just found that Degelia plumbia had such a wonderful feeling in the mouth. But they've gone and changed its name to something ho horrible like Pectinia something or other. So I'm most disappointed in that. So I suppose that's one is one of my favourite ones for its name. And then I, I love the, the stick does. Now, one of the problems of a lot of the lichens is they don't really have common names. And the things about the stick does is if you actually rub them when they're wet and stick the, your fingers to your nose, it's quite horrible because they smell of rotting fish. Um, so, yeah. And then I'm very fond of green lungwort as well, especially if you look at the, there's um, a couple of quite, well, there's one, my favourite tree in the borough at Sheep Karen is absolutely clotted in green um, lungwort. So, yeah, I, I not really even... a favourite, but a heap of I... them. Sharon, I, I shouldn't have even started. <laughs> sorry, you might want to mention you have a wonderful Instagram account, I think, where you record some of the lichens. Do you want to? I, you, I used to have an Instagram account, which unfortunately I have tended to put aside now because I'm just too busy and I found it was becoming <clears throat> too time, time consuming and I was, yeah, spending too, time on, too much time on it instead of actually going out in the world and looking at it. I mean, that's I used to walk in Hazel Woodlands an awful lot more in the past than I do. And it was only really when I was asked to do this talk that I went out again for the last two weeks and started to rethink about them. And from that point of view, it's been good. But yeah, it's. Dead. I, 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 want, I, want to, I want to squeeze in a quick question of mine, um, Kate, before you start um, reading out some of the questions. Um, Sharon, you mentioned the percentage of hazel in the burren in the 1940s. Was it in the first few slides? Was it under 2% or something? Is, that, is anyone more, has anyone monitored the percentage of hazel woodland in the burren now? Is there any current data on that? Um, <coughs> there, there, is, there, is a, there is some data being gathered at the moment through a PhD um, in GMIT. Um, Way back in, um, I think it's 2003 and four, I, I created a, a map using satellite imagery just of the High Buran. And at that time, we estimated that something like 14% of the High Buran uh, was covered in quite, quite dense hazel woodland, but that there was probably another, I think it was five to 10% at least, 
was affected by encroaching hazel. And that's that's probably an underestimation because there's places I've been into recently where I remember going in there 10 years ago and hazel being knee high and now it's taller than me um, and the grassland is disappearing. So it really is something that is increasing all the time. I can see like when you do retire Sharon you're not gonna get bored <laughs> you have so much to do as uh, some of the comments in chat at the moment Jenny Maguire says thank you Sharon I don't need convincing but the talk was brilliant um Daniel Kelly has said have you found the yellow bird's nest in the Burren uh, I think I showed a picture of it there um, well, that was a Burren yeah yeah, that was the boring. Uh, as, as, as the, the best way to find things is to be caught short and nip into the hazel scrub. And invariably, <laughs> that's how I first came across hazel gloves in the fung in, in the boring. And that's actually how I first came across the yellow bird's nest in the boring. Um, so so just drink lots of water coffee. or coffee before you go for a walk. <laughs> I've got great pictures in my head here now so we'll just we'll stop on that one so um we've got Paul Whelan I suppose this is kind of the opposite of what Prangeli has said uh, Sharon what area of the Burren is covered by the grassland that you speak of so that's kind of whatever's left after the hazel percentage I suppose oh, because you've got you've got huge tracts of um of, of limestone pavement and that I don't have that figure off the top of my head um I was yeah I don't um in terms of calcareous grassland the the type that's actually protected under the um legislation it's actually a lot less than we we think an awful lot more of our grasslands in the Burren probably verging more to neutral than uh calcareous but i think that's climatic uh and we shouldn't dismiss them because they're often more orchid rich than the orchid rich calcareous grasslands the other thing about the Burren is it's very difficult to look at an area and say that's a grassland because when you get there you discover it's not a grassland at all it's actually a heathland particularly with dryest heath so yeah i i don't i don't know i'd have to go back and try and calculate that from a map i think we'll, we'll let you off on that one you, you're doing very good you. <laughs> if you think else uh, carmel has said great talk i will never walk amongst the hazel again and not appreciate it Neil, you can even your own colleagues are saying they've taken a full page of notes, Sharon. <laughs> so, so that's Lord. always it's good to know they listen to you. Uh, Catherine Seal has asked, can you plant hazel as a hedge and what soil does it need? Yes, you can plant hazel as a hedge. In fact, my first experience of hazel would be as a hedgerow species um, when I was growing up. Um, Soil, it generally prefers a slightly more alkaline soil, more free draining, but it's fairly happy um, as long as it's not dumped in something really, really wet and too acidic. Um, and an interesting aside um, in terms of when I was growing up and you'd see the hazel in the hedge and I'd see the hazelnuts and I'd often think, great, I'm going to have that hazelnut when it's ripe. And I never, ever saw a ripe hazelnut because the gray squirrels tend to eat them before they're right, not which the red squirrels don't do. So I always lost out on uh, eating the hazel to the gray squirrels. It's, it's a hard life. And Joan is asking, are you in favor of increasing stocks of goat to control the spread of hazel? Now there's a question. Hmm. Now, very interesting one. I had a massive argument with uh, a guy in the Boron once a farmer. He was saying that goats control hazel and I said they don't because my experience of walking around in the Boran is that I know places where you've got massive numbers of goats and what they do is they suppress all the other tree species so they might suppress ash, white beam, they'll suppress um, holly and that but the hazel once it's above a certain size just keeps bump 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 growing away thickening up quite happily they'll take some leaves they'll rub the bark but it doesn't really keep it under control now when I thought about it after we'd finished having the argument I think both myself and the farmer were coming at it from different points because I'm looking at hazel that is fairly well on and he was talking about his youth when there was much less hazel about and you had higher populations of of 
domestic goats and those domestic goats kept tended to be kept ar um, around an area so in those areas when the hazel was very small they did tend to have more of an impact and keep it down but I'm far from convinced what I saw it back in the early 2000s when the goat populations were really high in the Burren you could go and you you literally would see the the impact of goats particularly over at Mullet Moor um, where the yew trees that are in cages were topiary to totally square um, and once the, there had been the goat call and a lot were taken out, those yew trees started bursting out the cages and you'd see ash and holly with rapid growth. And then as the numbers of goats started to increase again, they started to nibble back those leaders. Meanwhile, hazel, bump, 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 bump. So, no. <laughs> that, that's the short version of the argument. I'm very impressed. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. Um, also, all the people, very enjoyable. I know a lot more about Hazel. One of our members is called Hazel, so she says it was lovely to hear her name mentioned so many times. Um, and is it true that Hazel has a shallow root system? Well, I was reading something there for a while back. Um, which actually wasn't talking about a shallow root system. Um, and it was talking about quite an extensive system that Hazel spends an awful lot of its early growth investing in its root system. So if you go, that Hazel I showed on the rock, that was, a, that was a, a new seedling. And you can pull them out in the first year. Once they're beyond a year old, you cannot pull them out. They'll break, but they're fairly anchored. And even though they break, they'll come back. So I, I wouldn't say it's a shallow root system. I'd say it's quite extensive and it's probably that root system that makes hazel so hard to kill and also uh, makes it so suitable for coppicing um, that it can draw back in probably uh, using fungi and other things to draw nutrients back into the plant to get it regrowing again before it starts photosynthesizing. So fungi and its own um, energy reserves in its roots. Lovely, Sharon. And we're, we're down to the last few. You are doing brilliant. You're hanging in there and you've had no arguments with us yet. So we're all we're looking good. So <clears throat> the next comment and the next question kind of tie in together. So Dara says, um, amazing talk. Can I ask, can you eat the not from all hazels or is there certain edible varieties? And an anonymous attendee says, is it OK to pick hazelnuts? So kind of two questions put together in one there. Yes, you can. You can eat the hazelnuts. Um, they tend to be small. The ones we, we get uh, in shops generally come from, uh, I think, Turkey mainly, and they are a, a, often a bigger variety. And even in Britain, the cobnut really is a variety that was selected of, of the typical hazelnut. And quite often when I'm out in the Burren and hazelnut time is ready, you'll find me cracking nuts and you can track where I've been by this little trail of broken nuts. And in fact, <laughs> Um, my dog, uh, my late dog, was really, really keen on eating hazelnuts. She used to go round picking them off, off the bushes and eating them. Um, and unfortunately, as she got older and fewer teeth, I used to try breaking them for her. And she'd quite often turn down the nuts that I'd, I'd picked. Um, I, not good. So, yes, you can eat the hazelnuts and pick away, because the more you pick and eat, the more it can slow the spread of the hazel onto the grasslands say this maybe we think we've been tracking red squirrels and it was actually we were tracking Sharon and her lunch <laughs> <laughs> um I think that's it with the questions and comments so Sharon that was um hugely enjoyable it really was really really interesting to kind of hear about the, the balance that we have to keep and I think that's something we work on a lot with the volunteers as well as the farming program isn't it um you know protecting the the good mature stuff taking away some of the encroaching stuff so it's it's just really nice to actually hear the positive and to see why we have to keep the balance as well 